Ramahandia. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like preaching tonight. Glory to God. No strange fire. The Lord says, no strange fire. What is he talking about? Let's get straight into the word. Please turn your Bible with me to Leviticus chapter 9. We're going to read a few verses from chapter 9 and then we're going to go to chapter 10 from which we're going to be reading the first three verses. But in order for us to get some context, we have to begin at the ninth chapter of Leviticus. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. As you join, you know exactly what to do. And that is for you to hit that share button that is just below the video. By doing so, you'll allow your friends and loved ones, people you know, as well as those you don't even know, to benefit from the holy word of truth. Whether you're watching the live stream or the rebroadcast, ensure that you do your due diligence of sharing sharing and liking and if you have not yet subscribed ensure that you do so also please be on the alert for scammers or imposters pretending to be me there are numerous fraudulent pages on all platforms facebook tiktok and instagram and also youtube i don't know what they're doing over there but i know people have been reporting fraudulent attempts to get their attention so please be mindful of all those fake pages yes they're using my picture and yes they're using my name but know that i only have one legitimate page on each platform all right as you join please do not hesitate to hit share we want to get into the holy word of truth which shall be meat for us tonight tell to people i'm hungry no for sure i'm hungry for some food that is some spiritual food. How about you? Tell someone, I'm hungry, and then ask them, are you? Are you? <laughs> Glory to God. So let's do this quickly. Uh, we're going to sensitize the individuals who usually watch with us on social media that we are live, and the only way to do so is to hit share. Again, we're going to start reading from Leviticus chapter 9. Last week, I gave you a homework. I believe it was on Tuesday or Wednesday. I put a post um, on which I said, please study Leviticus chapter 10. Let me see the hands of those of you who actually obeyed and you did read the chapter after seeing that post. Let me see those of you on Facebook. I think I had put it on Facebook first. You saw the post on which I said that I want you to study Leviticus 10. Let me see if you followed. All right. I think in a moment, I'll be able to see your comments, amen? Oh, I think I gotta do something. I wanna make sure that you're getting the best quality of streaming. Are we all hearing and seeing clearly? Let me just make sure on all platforms. Hello, I just need a yes on the screen if you're hearing and seeing clearly on TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube. Hello? Great. Anyone on TikTok? Great. Facebook? great leviticus chapter 9 hallelujah so let me see if i can do this reading as quickly as possible and it came to pass on the eighth day that moses called aaron and his sons and the elders of israel and he said unto aaron you take a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, You take a kid of the goats for a sin offering. You take also a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering. Also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord and a meat offering mingled with oil for today the Lord will appear unto you. 
And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, go unto the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make an atonement for yourself and for the people and offer the offering of the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Aaron therefore went onto the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the call above the liver of the sin offering, he burned upon the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. And the flesh and the hide he burned with fire without the camp. And he killed the burnt offering and Aaron's son presented unto him the blood which he sprinkled round about upon the altar. And they presented the burnt offering unto him with the pieces thereof and the head and the burnt them or he burnt them upon the altar. And he did wash the inwards and the legs and burnt them upon the burnt offering on the altar. In a short moment from now, I'm going to actually explain to you what was going on here. Verse 15, and he brought the people's offerings and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people and killed it and offered it for sin at the first. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the manner. And he brought the meat offering and took a handful thereof and burnt it upon the altar beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. He killed also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. And the fat of the bullock and of the ram, the rump and that which covered the inwards and the kidneys and the call above the liver. And they put the fat upon the breasts and he burned the fat upon the altar. And the breast and the right shoulder, Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and they fell on their faces. And Nadab and Abihu, Abihu rather, the sons of Aaron took either of them his incense or rather his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spoke saying, I will be sanctified in them who come near me and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. <clears throat> Someone say, speak, Lord, speak. Raise your hands right where you are. Hallelujah. Father, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Lord, today is the day when you have appointed for this message to be delivered, 
You've helped me to carry it safely in my womb. Now I need your help to deliver. Now I need your help to push. Now I need the anointing. Hallelujah. To give birth. I need you, Jehovah. Speak through me. Use my mouth. Use my hands. Use my eyes. Great Father, I minister unto you first before the people. Now I ask, Lord, that you'll stand right in front of me though you are in me and allow me to minister unto you. And I do hope that this ministration will be acceptable before you, Father. And I do it with the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thank you for the grace. Now I ask that you'll open up the eyes of your people, open up also their ears as well as their hearts. Lift your voice in our midst. Amplify your voice, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you've heard us and that indeed your will shall be accomplished in our midst. In Jesus' mighty, precious, extraordinary name. Amen. I'll give you 30 more seconds, family, to hit that share button. And if you've shared, just type shared in the comments. Glory to God. If you're on YouTube, remember you got to hit that like button to your right, or maybe it's to your bottom right or bottom left. On my end, I guess the position of these things are different from how they look on your screen. So we're going to thank you so much, Topaz. Thank you, Lady Nicole. Great seeing you, Angela, and thank you so much for sharing. Great seeing you, Lashona. Thank you for sharing. Erica, great to have you as well. I want us to be ready for this word. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Just type, I'm ready. Great to see you, Sister Sheila. Thank you for joining. If you're ready, just type, I'm ready. I am ready. <clears throat> so let's get straight into it. The book of Leviticus is one of those books that many say is hard to read and it's hard to understand. Let me see those of you who agree. When I was a new convert, I really just did not understand Leviticus. I couldn't understand what all these sacrifices, altars, offerings, and blood shedding were all about. I would read the scripture, but without understanding. And so today I want to thank God for helping me. And I'm sure you're saying the same thing. We're thanking him for helping us to get to a place where we can read Leviticus and understand exactly what he's saying. And for the benefit of those of us who do not yet understand, surely the Lord will be helping you tonight as he opens up what we have read from the ninth and 10th chapters. Let's go. So by this time, we would have known that Aaron had been selected as priest, high priest, that is, over God's people. Then we would have learned by this time in scripture that Aaron had two sons, Nadab and Abihu. Please put their names in the comments for me. Hallelujah. That's Nadab, N-A-D-A-B, and then Abihu, that's A-B-I-H-U. These were the two sons of Aaron. And while Aaron was high priest, his two sons were also priests over God's people. Okay? Now, these two sons of Aaron would have seen, okay, the ceremonies performed by their father under instructions given to him by Moses 
who represented God. Moses was God's mouthpiece. It was through him that Aaron was getting his instructions, right? Now, as it pertains to the ceremonies that were supposed to be performed in the tabernacle, as well as without, all the instructions were given to Moses while he was on top of that mountain. And we all know that's Mount Sinai. As we've said before in previous sermons, Moses went on top of Sinai for two main reasons. The first was for him to receive the Ten Commandments. And the second main reason for him going on Sinai was for him to receive instructions on how to build the tabernacle and how to carry out tabernacle duties. Someone say, I understand you, Shadeen. So having been given clear instructions from Jehovah about what was required, here comes Moses telling Aaron in front of his sons because they were in training. Delta people, Aaron's sons were in training. And if you're training someone, of course, they need to be present to see how the thing is done. I can recall that when I was in the corporate world, whenever HR had hired someone new and they wanted the person to learn my task, they would literally put the person beside me. They would have them seated next to me so that they could see exactly what I did, okay? And that person, if he or she wanted to be effective in replacing me or taking over the position, because maybe I was going on vacation or something, it would have been in their best interest to make note and to carefully assess all the details. And so we want to believe that similarly, Aaron's two sons who were in training were paying key, keen attention to what was being said to their father, Aaron, and what was being done by him as he followed instructions. So I'm going to break down for you now some things that were said in the hearing of these two young men who we said were what? In training. Are we hearing? So the first thing to note is this, the book of Leviticus is a book of symbols. Tell to people there are myriad symbols in the book of Leviticus. And a lot of the things that the book symbolizes come to one thing, and that is Christ and the cross. Okay? Now, let me break down some of the things we've actually read. In chapter 9, the Bible talks about a few offerings, the first of which was the sin offering. Then there was the burnt offering. Then we learned about the peace offering, rather the meat offering, then the peace offering, and then we later heard about a wave offering. So please put these offerings in the comments if you can. Hallelujah. Those of you who are on YouTube, you got to do better. I know I've been very inconsistent in coming on of late, so that's why you got to do your due diligence to ensure that people know that we're live. Okay? So type these offerings in the comments for me quickly. Sin offering, burnt offering, meat offering, peace offering, wave offering. How many offerings have we accounted for so far? Sin, burnt, meat, peace, wave, five different offerings, okay? Are we paying attention? Now understand that these five offerings were not all offered at the same time. Very important. Another thing, they were offered before Jehovah in a specific order. Very important as well. So all the offerings were not given at the same time. And we're saying that they were not randomly offered either. 
they were offered in a certain order. And now I want you to pay attention to the order. The first offering mentioned in scripture was the sin offering. The Bible talked about the requirements for sin offering being offering up a young calf, a young, they're right here, a kid of the goat, and also a lamb. Only these three animals were expected to be offered based on the instructions given to Aaron for the sin offering. It is very interesting how while I was reading this, like the Holy Spirit was saying something to me. He was saying I should pay attention to the kinds of animals or the age of the animals that were being offered for sin. I'm just realizing that the sin offering was not to be given in the form of a big cow, a big goat, a ram goat, and an old sheep. But guess what? Instead, the Lord said, I want you to bring a young goat, a young sheep, which is called a lamb, and also a calf. And none of these animals that are going to be sacrifices should pass one year of age okay they shouldn't be over one year and you know what when i saw this part of the verse it helped me to understand why the latter part of verse three says they should be without blemish and that's very important the Holy Spirit's revelation as it pertains to why the animals needed to be this young and why it couldn't be a ram goat that was of five years of age, somebody, somebody's ram goat that they had for 10 years or five years. Because understand, the younger the thing is, the more likely it is that the thing is pure. Anybody agrees? It's just like us as human beings. An older person is more likely to be someone who would have committed lots of sins as opposed to a child. So if sin speaks of impurities and corruption, then it's reasonable to say that an older person has more corruption than a child. Because children can do so much and no more. So in the case of the sacrifices that took on the form of animals, the younger the sacrifice was the closer the sacrifice was to being flawless. So aside from the fact that the Lord was also interested in the appearance of of the sacrifice. So when the scripture says it should not have any blemish, the Lord meant there should be no sores on the lamb. And if you're going to offer a calf, let it not be a calf that has maggots. Let it not be a calf that has a patch here and a patch there. Let it not be a goat or a young goat, or they call it a kid. Let it not be a kid that has a, a deficiency. So, Physical perfection was required and also purity. That's why, because remember now, this was going to be a sin offering. And the Lord cancels out sin with that which is pure. That's why Christ went to the cross because he alone matches that ideal person who is pure and perfect. Okay. These animals needed to be pure. They needed to be without blemish. So the Lord says, because I want a sin offering, it's something that is going to cancel out sin. 
And we know that oftentimes those things that come with sin make us corrupted. They cause us to be impure and full of blemish. The Lord says, give me sacrifices that are the opposite of what mankind represents. Give unto me sacrifices that through their symbolic meanings will cancel out all that sin does and represents. Okay? So we are not surprised that the sin offering entailed giving to God these animals that were not past one year of age and they were without blemish in terms of their outward appearance. It had to be so because these sacrifices symbolized a person. Maybe at the time when Moses was carrying out the rituals and Aaron and his two sons were making their observations, maybe in the moment they didn't really understand why they had to do all these things. But because we are now under a new dispensation that allows for the revelation of the things that were concealed under the old covenant, we can firmly say that all these sacrificial offerings were done as symbols. They symbolized something that was to come. And the animals themselves, what was done to them symbolized the work of one person. And who was he? He was Christ. So watch this. The first sacrifice that was required or the first offering was supposed to be a sin offering. And the reason for this is, if we're going to have reconciliation with God, if God is going to be reconciled to us or we reconcile to him, then the first thing that must be dealt with in our lives is sin. So we're not surprised that the first sacrifice that was required by the father was the one that would deal with sins. That was the biggest thing that had caused separation to begin with. It was sin that came in between God and Adam. Okay? So if we were going to participate in a ceremony that was going to represent the getting rid of sin thing and the covering of sin and reconciliation unto God, then sin was the first thing that needed to be dealt with. And that's why the first offering had to be the sin offering. When sin is dealt with in our lives, then we can, in fact, let me put it this way, God would then have the latitude to move in our midst in ways in which he would not have been able to because sin is like a blockage to the move of God. So now that sin was out of the way, the Lord was now going to ask for what is called a burnt offering. Someone type burnt offering on the screen. Hallelujah. The burnt offering was the kind of offering that was going to deal with, I want you to put this in the comments, purity slash perfection. Purity slash perfection. Now, if you look at how the burnt offering was handled, one of the things that you'll realize is that the inner part of the sacrifice was actually removed. I think I might have highlighted it here. It said, there was a part where the Lord said, scrape out its inner part. By doing so, the Lord was symbolizing a state of perfection. 
where we rid ourselves of those things that we have digested spiritually that have caused contamination in our bowels, our spiritual bowels. Those things that we have caused to come into our temples that as long as they remain there, they cause sicknesses. They cause all manner of infirmities, setbacks and delays. The Lord wants us to get rid of those things. Purify ourselves of those things. And so Christ was going to be symbolized even by the burnt offering. Because the only way you and I can ever be perfected in the sight of God, we have to experience that perfection only through the cross that is afforded to us by Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ already is the sin offering. And now we're learning that he's also the burnt offering because the burnt offering, as we said, deals with removing the inner parts of that sacrifice, separating it from its shell. And we're saying that God meant to illustrate to us the value of perfection in his sight. And he knows that we are all flesh. The Bible says, for we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, but through Christ, through Christ, we can attain a level of perfection in the sight of God. Be ye perfect was a command. Even if we do fall short, the command is still that we be perfect. And the only way we can even come close to it is if we go through the cross. Anybody understands? So they would have observed the sin offering and the burnt offering. Now the other offering was the meat offering. We're not surprised that the meat offering came after the first two offerings were given after sin was dealt with and after God dealt with us in a way that perfected us in his sight through his son, Jesus Christ. Now we offer unto him a meat offering and the meat offering represents God's abundance. The Bible says that he's rich in glory. When it comes to supplies, our father in heaven is extremely wealthy. He's not bankrupt in any way. When it comes to provisions, he has an abundance. Whatever you can think of that is good, God has it in great measures. So the meat represents his abundance and his supplies that he makes available to us on a daily basis. The Bible says that daily he loads us with benefits. Ain't that so? All these benefits are encompassed in the meat offering. And the only way we can get to a place in our lives where we appreciate and understand the capabilities of God to supply our needs according to his riches in glory is if we would have dealt with the sins in our lives because see, sins have a way of blinding us. I could not see the things that I'm seeing now while I was lost. I couldn't see them. So I know for sure that sin blinds us. And had we not given God the latitude to deal with us and to pluck from us those unwanted things to perfect us according to his image and likeness, then we would not have gotten to a place where we can see clearly that even though we have a job and even though we have streams of income and we're able to have families and businesses and so on, we get to realize that our true source is the father himself. Are you hearing me? 
if we would be honest with ourselves and before God, then we would say in this atmosphere that there's no way we could have known these things had we still been in the dark. Had we still been drowned in sin and no light had come to us, then we would never get it that the source of our supplies really come from God. The Bible says in him, we move, we live, and we have our very being. Even oxygen comes from him. I did not even know that. And I told you about my science background. I'm so glad the Lord has delivered me from that area. I'm sorry, I'm just saying, I'm glad I'm no longer walking that path of science. Because science taught me about H2O, hydrogen particles, oxygen molecules, and you name it. Science did not tell me anything about God, but now that the light has come, now that the sin offering has been given and the burnt offering too, now I'm able to see that God is our source. And that in everything good, God is at the foundation. And now that we see that God is, we can eat from his supplies. We can benefit from his supplies. So no wonder the order is of such sin offering, then burnt offering, then meat offering. And what did we say comes after the meat offering? It's the peace offering. Now, the peace offering represented a statement to say this. I'm going to put it in simple terms for us. Now that you have been reconciled unto the Father, you can finally enjoy peace that comes through him. You can enjoy peace with him and peace through him. If you're wondering why you're tormented, why everything seems to be upside down, your life is like a living hell, misery is on all sides, clearly the peace of God is missing from your life. It's missing. And how do we get the peace of God? The formula is right here. It's it's right through the book. It's, it's just amazing how the Old Testament is saying the same thing that the New Testament is saying and vice versa. They're just put in different ways. The formula is this. If you want peace in your life, you're going to have to first deal with the sin in your life. This is not just a you thing, you know. This is a universal requirement. It's a universal law. Not one of us is exempt from this law. If you want peace, peace don't just come. And if we're talking about godly peace, because now we get to understand through the words of Jesus that there are two types of peace. There is godly peace and there is worldly peace. The Lord Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. So that's the worldly peace to which he was alluding. And the worldly peace is a conditional kind of peace. It's a peace that says, as long as I see money in my account, I have peace. As long as I get my salary on time, I'm at peace. But if things go out of whack, there shall be no peace. I'll be miserable and everybody around me will also be miserable because of my misery. The Lord says that's a worldly kind of peace. The peace that I've come to give you. Watch this. Look at the peace offering speaking now. Look at the peace offering making himself known. The peace offering who is Christ Jesus himself, which is what this thing, the peace offering in the Leviticus scriptures represented he said my my peace i give to you not as the world giveth do i give 
So whether you have little or much, you will have peace. Whether you were approved or disappointed, you will have peace. Whether they accepted you or they rejected you, you will enjoy my peace. Whether you were terminated or not, you will still have peace. You will not lose sleep. You will not lose weight. You will not go crazy. You will not sink into a state of depression. Irrespective of your circumstance, you will find peace. You will have peace. You will enjoy peace. That's what the ultimate peacemaker says. And I'm so happy the Lord has outlined how we come to attain peace. Peace don't just come if we're talking about the godly peace. If we want to experience godly peace, we have to deal with the sin factor in our lives. Then we have to be perfected in holiness and consecration. Do you hear me? And then we can experience the richness of God's blessings in our lives through his provisions. And if God is blessing us and we are beholding his blessings, we will indeed enjoy his peace. Then the other offering that is mentioned is a wave offering. At the time when the wave offering was mentioned, the Bible says that Aaron would have already carried out certain parts of the ceremony. He was now at the end. Before he would have left the presence of the people, the Lord instructed that he lifted up his hands and waved. And after he waved, the Bible said that he would stretch his hands while lifted up toward the people and he would bless the people. Now I want you to understand the significance of this. Someone say, I'm listening. Someone say, I'm hearing you clearly. The reason Aaron was required to wave his hands before he blessed the people and released them was this. By him lifting up his hands to heaven, he was saying something in the spirit. Here is the statement that was being made. The blessing that Aaron would have released upon the people were not Aaron's blessings. They came from above. So that is why before he pronounced a blessing upon them, before he could say, may the face of the Lord shine upon you, may the light of his countenance be upon you, may he give you his peace, before he could say all of that, he would wave his hands he would lift his hands before God because it was imperative for the people to know that Aaron did not have the power to bless them. And so if they got any blessing in that atmosphere, they needed to know that the blessing came from above. So he waved as he blessed, his hands were outstretched and lifted because God was not going to share his glory. He wanted people to know that blessings do not just come. Blessings come from him. And the Bible says the blessings of the Lord, he maketh rich and he adds no sorrow to it. I want you to understand. I feel like inserting this. It wasn't a part of the plan, but it's coming to my spirit. Just because you see people benefiting from many things in their lives don't mean that it's a blessing from God. I want you to know that. 
Are you hearing me? Do you remember how Satan said unto Jesus in the wilderness? He said, if you would bow down to me, then I'm going to give you all of this. And he showed him various kingdoms and riches. And he said, I will give these to you. So just because you see people showing off their things, expensive things, valuable things, don't mean it's God who gave them. And that is why we will not practice to covet people because we do not know how they ascertained what they have. Just because they were gifted something does not mean that that gift came from the hand of God. That gift might be a weapon in disguise. That gift might be a weapon of mass destruction in disguise. That same gift as a car, for instance, might be the very said car that will claim the person's life. How could it have been a blessing? How? The blessing of the Lord, he maketh rich. And to it, he adds no sorrow. None. And we know that there are instances in which people are really blessed, but they mismanage or mishandle the blessing of the Lord. But I want us to also know that a lot of the things that have come to many individuals that they claim are blessings were never given by God. They were part of a plot. They were part of a plan, a conspiracy for them to meet their demise. Do you understand? Good. So, after Aaron did the wave, blessed the people, and they had come out of the tabernacle, the Bible says that the people and Moses and Aaron and the two sons of Aaron, they noticed that there was a fire that came out and consumed the sacrifices. And the Bible says that when the people saw the fire and how it consumed the sacrifices, the Bible says they shouted and they fell on their faces because this was what you call a wonder. You know, the Bible talks about signs and wonders. This was a wonder. If you were to behold this very thing, you'd probably be shaking nonstop. I feel like I'd probably be shaking violently. This was a wonder. This was a supernatural occurrence right before their eyes. God sends out his fire and he consumes the sacrifices. But I want us to note why the fire came and consumed the sacrifice. Simply put, it's because the Lord was pleased with the sacrifice. And not only was he pleased, but he had accepted the sacrifice. Do you hear me? Kashuku Turibi Kata. Whenever the Lord accepts your sacrifice, Rakushanta Kusheketaya, Rakushataya, because you would have met the criteria, Kashoko Sikata, the spiritual criteria, Rikanamakoto. God's response is usually to release his fire. Masheke to Kushanamakoto. But there's something that happened after this marvelous occurrence. Having seen the fire of God, these two foolish sons of Aaron, Abihu and Nadab, they became like many Christians today. Or may I say many people, because 
other religions are included and other folks are included. They were amazed by the release of the fire. They were amazed by what the fire did. And they decided that they were going to create for themselves their own fire. They remind us of the individuals around us who want to take the shortcut. They want the same end results, you know, hello, but they don't want to fast. They don't want to pray. There are people who want to still knock heads with people who are in the world, so they still want to go to the parties. They still want to buy the VIP tickets to all these secular shows. They want to still mix and mingle. They don't want to come out from among them and be separated, yet they have the same expectations. So you expect to be just as anointed as Sister Patsy. You who spend your time hanging out with people who drink a lot, hanging out with people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit a lot, and while you're there, you giggle and you don't even put them in their place to say, no, what you're saying is not acceptable. That's, that's not right. They're so lukewarm that they don't even know how to rebuke their friends. They laugh and come in agreement with people who mock the living God. And these people expect to be used in the same way that God uses someone who dedicates their time to prayer and fasting. It will not happen. So when these people begin to covet all these amazing outcomes, totally ignoring how the person got to that point where they can be used by God in that manner, they decide that they're going to create their own way. They decide that they're going to come up with their own technique. And I hear the Lord saying to remind someone that there is only one way. There is one way, Shekuturibie. One way, kata, zatush kata, rama, koto, sheke. One way. This is why many people have resorted to consulting with wizards for powers. They've gone to sorcerers for powers. They've engaged in all these demonic rituals. Why? Because they covet the fire that was poured out from heaven and refuse to go through the right channel or the right route in order to get the fire. If we don't want to deal with the sin factor in our lives, we can't even move past step one. We're going to be stuck at step one because that's the first requirement. So we covet the fire. Nadab and Abihu coveted the fire. But they were not going to do it the right way. And the Holy Spirit says, if it's not done his way, and his way is for us to go through the cross. And how did we get to the cross where we could arrive at the feet of Jesus? We, as individuals, would have had to take up our own cross. And we would have had to put our faith entirely in him. Now, people don't want to trust in God and wait on his timing and his processing. And as a result, they venture into things to get powers, as I said. They venture into all these ceremonies. They get their hands dirty. They carry out all their various transactions. But they don't want to go through the way of the cross. The Lord says any fire, 
any fire that is raised up before him that did not come about by him or from him is a strange fire and he will not accept it. Any strange fire that is found in his presence is going to result in death, saith the Lord. Are you hearing me? They decided to use their their cans okay apparently they each were given cans in which maybe they had kerosene oil or something i don't know but they were able to light a fire and they had the audacity of not just lighting the fire outside the tabernacle but they had the audacity to go through the tabernacle door which was christ but remember, there was no blood on them. They, they were, this was strange in its entirety. So they were going through the door illegally. They moved past the door and made their way to the altar of incense. And if you look at the back of my book, I've seen Jesus. I wish I had a copy. I usually have a copy next to me at the back. I showed you a diagram of the setup of the tabernacle. If you look at the diagram now at the back of your book, you will see exactly where the altar of incense was placed. It was directly in front of the veil. So these men would have had the audacity, okay, to pass through the door. Then they passed by the table of showbread then they passed by the lampstands and all this time they could have stopped their conscience was were not speaking to them uh -uh. they went all the way up to the altar of incense and the devil told them to light their own fire <laughs> and you know what is crazy they claimed that they were offering this fire unto our father. How dare them? Because their fire was unrecognized by the living God. Because man does not light a fire before God. God is the one who gives fire unto us. We don't give him fire. It's the reverse. He gives it to us. Now, here's the thing that the Lord says concerning these strange fires. The Spirit of God says, when it comes on to the fire, here's why these two men had to be consumed. The fire is supposed to go on flesh that is already dead. Think about that. Whenever the fire was poured out on the sacrifice, remember that the sacrifice were the animals that were killed. And the fire could have only come not when the animals were alive, but when they were dead. The fire of God, brethren, comes only upon us who are dead. Dead to sin. Dead. When our flesh is too much alive in the presence of God and in his house, no fire will come upon you. And if you claim that there is some fire in your midst, I want you to know that's not the fire of the Holy Ghost. Who gave you people that fire? How can we not want to deal with the sins in our lives? Which is something we got to deal with on a daily basis. On a daily basis. You know, something I want to notice, I want to point out, rather, before I come back to this point. It's stated here in the seventh verse of the ninth chapter. I want us to read it together quickly. And Moses said unto Aaron, 
go onto the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make an atonement for yourself and for the people. But notice, he was to make atonement for who first? Quickly, who was he supposed to make atonement for? First and foremost, who? Quickly. You're not answering. Someone is asking which scripture? Leviticus 9, and I just read verse 7. Leviticus 9, 7. Self. He was supposed to deal with his own sins before he was in a position to deal with other people's sins. Now that is a lesson that we all need to take into our lives. Ministers of the Lord, myself included. One of the best approach to ministry, and this is something that I practice personally, is I have to go before the living God every day before I stand before his people. I've told you this before. Before I come online, which is not much different from being in person, hold on. In other words, in the same way I take my in-person meetings seriously, I do take online ministrations very seriously. If I stand to preach online or in person, it's same preaching. There will be no different. I'll not fake any of them. And I will not tweak anyone like, oh, I'm going to tweak the online version because maybe I'll be speaking to someone who is from this place or this class in life. No. No. So I take every ministration opportunity very seriously. And before I feel like I'm worthy to minister to you, one of the things I practice consistently is to ensure that I go to God and I deal with me. It's something that he, through his spirit, guides me to do, by the way. Like I cannot stand before the camera, for instance, if I know that there is something that I need to handle through prayers and repentance. I don't. I feel like that is called presumptuous sins. And even if it's done one time, it should not happen again. But we thank God for grace, right? But here's the thing. The point is, we want to deal with ourselves first. We want to reconcile ourselves first. Aaron had to handle himself first. He had to reconcile himself first. Then he was fit to reconcile the other people. And I hope that all of us can take a page out of his book. Now let's go back to what we were talking about. As mentioned in the 10th chapter, when these men decided to offer strange fire unto the living God. The Lord says that his fire can only consume sacrifices. And by all means and estimation, sacrifices are those things that are dead. When we are too alive in our flesh, we are not to expect any pouring out of any fire. For some of us, you're too much. We're too much. There's too much of us going on. We're still doing us. We don't know what it means to be crushed. We don't know what it means to die to certain things. And that is why when people try to argue with us, we're still arguing back. We don't know what it means to hear people slander us and humiliate us and cry and say nothing. And just say to God, 
whoever wants to believe, believe. But because I know that you have dealt with me, Lord, I'm not even in a position to open my mouth and defend myself. That's what the crushing does. The crushing says, do not answer back. Whoever it is who is tormenting you on the job or wherever. The crushing says, ignore, because you're dead now. You're dead. And so many will try to provoke you in different ways. And the old man is trying to make its way in because the old man would not stand for this offense. The old man would speak a long time ago. The old man would do all manner of things. The old man don't know anything about praying. The old man don't fight with prayers. The old man does fist fights. The old man says, fleshly fight, hand for hand, foot for foot, mouth for mouth. When the old man is still too alive, expect no fire. The fire can only consume those things that are dead. Do you hear me? When there's too much of you that is going on, there will be no fire. You're still speaking the way you always spoke. In my book, I've seen Jesus. I've described for many of you what the threshing floor process was like. And you know what? I feel like I'm going through another phase of the threshing floor. And rightfully so, because I'm getting to realize that before I can go, every time the Lord wants to take me to another level, before I get to that level, like I, I keep on having to be reprocessed. So I'm not ashamed to say I'm back on the, thresh, the threshing floor. Because when you thought that you would have attained a certain level of humility, certain level of patience and meekness and so on. Here God is saying, okay, at this level where I want to perform certain wonders through you, you're, you're going to need to be crushed some more. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Some of us don't know what it means to cry it out. And to remain silent. When they group up against you. When they gather against you. When they speak all manner of lies against you. Yet God is saying be like Christ. Say nothing. Do you know how hard it is? Do you know how hard it is to do such a thing? The only way one can remain silent in the midst of conspiracies, in the midst of slanders, in the midst of gossip for which many Christians are going straight to hell. There is a special place in hell for it, for all those who gossip, for all those who backbite. I was listening to a guy's testimony the other day, he went to hell. And the interviewer at one point in the interview said to him, tell me what sins did the Christians who commit who were in hell, what sins did they commit? And the guy said there were many sins, but most were there for gossip. How do you hear people do things and say things about you that are not true, but you can't talk? You can't. And you're dead. How can your husband say something that hurt you so much and you don't reply? How can your wife speak to you in the manner in which she did just now in front of all those people and you don't become equal with her and embarrass her? How? How do we stand in the midst of adversity and opposition and we can't do anything we cannot defend ourselves we can't 
If we're still doing that, we need to be crushed some more. We need to go on the threshing floor. Or if we went there before, we got to go there again. I've never seen in all the offerings that were offered up by Moses, by Aaron, by all the priests that we have seen throughout the Old Testament, by Solomon who offered thousands of animal sacrifices. I've never seen where fire came down on any sacrifice that was still alive. In fact, if the animal was still alive, it was not qualified to be called a sacrifice. The thing needs to die. And the fire will consume it because it's already dead. So it won't feel the heat. They watched as the fire from heaven ate up the shell. Them bones, them skulls, them skin. What an, an amazing scene that was. Understand that the bodies of those animals were numb to the fire. Because they were already dead. And in the same way how the fire ate up everything, leaving nothing there. That's how God wants to consume your life with his presence. Any other way means that it's strange. He does not recognize it. As a matter of fact, I want us to turn our Bibles quickly to Romans 6, verse 10 to 11. Let us read this scripture to confirm what I just said about being dead. Romans 6. For in that he died, he died unto sin. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord wants us to become dead to sin. That's where he wants us to be. And if we know within ourselves that we're not quite there, we must try our hardest to get there. As long as you're still breathing, it can still happen. And it remains a work in progress. Do you hear me? Now, we're talking about strange things that have made their way in the sight of God, even in his house. There are strange miracles taking place. How did those miracles come about? There are strange signs. Strange worship. How can we say we are worshiping the true and living God and we're still praying send back to sender? Is which God told you to send back to sender? How can we say we are worshiping the true and living God and we feel like we need tape measure around our belly? How do we say we are worshiping the true and living God in spirit and in truth and we feel like we need 20 candles lined out on a table in front of us? For what? That's a strange altar. That's a strange ritual. That's a strange prayer. That's a strange worship. It's not God. How can
can we say we are worshiping the true and living God? When we pour what is supposed to represent the blood of Jesus Christ in the Holy Communion, we be pouring those things on the ground and on people's heads. Jesus' blood should not be poured on someone's head. That's strange. That's a strange communion. It's not even holy. If God does not approve it or if it doesn't meet the standard of God, it's not holy. So those of us who don't want to spend time in the presence of God, eating his word as food, reviving ourselves through prayer, meditating on scripture, in order to be filled with the Holy Ghost, we start speaking our own tongues that's strange before God, strange tongues, and we expect that our tongues will be tongues of fire. Which fire? Which fire? Anything that we did not attain by means of Jesus Christ who went to the cross is strange. If we did not follow the route that was detailed here in the scripture we read, it's strange if it ever came in if it ever made its way in, it's strange. And what happens to strange things and strange people? They're usually the people themselves, you know. See, ultimately, God wants to consume the sacrifice. But when we don't offer up the sacrifice in the right way before God, the end result is God consuming the person who has gone a wrong way or a different way and sometimes purposefully or may I say a strange way. So a lot of people who continue to practice these abominable things, ceremonies and rituals, you don't know, you're playing with your life. If you do not cease from offering up these strange things before God and keep calling his name over them, know that there indeed is going to be a fire, but not the kind of fire that you so covet or desire. It's the kind of fire from the wrath of God that's going to cause your life to come to an end before you expect it to. Stop playing with the living God. What is holy ought to remain holy. Whatever is strange needs to remain out of his presence. And we need to separate his name from those things that are strange. Now we recall what happened to someone who was strange, who, whose attire was strange in the presence of God. It's found in a parable that was delivered through one of Jesus' sermons in Matthew chapter 26. Let me see if we can go there quickly. In fact, it's Matthew 22. Please put this in the comments. Those of you who are just joining Please ensure that you're allowing your friends and your loved ones and those who follow you on Facebook to hear the holy word of truth. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. Nothing beats the word of God. It's one thing that will never expire on social media, ever. As you join, you make sure that someone who the Lord puts in your spirit who needs to hear this word, you do your due diligence to ensure that you share. Some of us are so 
concerned about how people will feel about us, then you ain't dead yet. And who not gonna like you or talk to you anymore? You ain't dead yet. Because one thing I know about this journey, it feels very lonely at times. There isn't much friend and company on this journey. So you ain't dead yet. If you're afraid to ensure that the word of God reaches the four corners of this world and reaches all the people who are in your circle, who he puts in your spirit, needs to hear it. So, Matthew 22. In it, the Lord Jesus talks about a wedding feast. I spoke about this during the Hartford encounter in details. So if you wanna hear the sermon, you're welcome to go on my Facebook page and you may scroll down to the title that says the Hartford encounter. You'll hear me dissect this word by the grace of God. But here's something in the parable that I want to allude to today. It's found in verse 11 and 12. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, how did you think you could come in hither not having a wedding garment? So watch this. Here was the end result of that person who was wearing a strange garment. The king said to the servants who were there, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So therefore, when we go in, when we come in, when we enter by a strange means or our worship is strange, our prayers are strange, our rituals are strange, our attire, is strange. Certainly the person will feel the fire, but it's not the fire that they had wanted. It's the fire that has been specially prepared for all those who don't want to go through the way, the one way, the only way. So let us not continue to be fooled because there is one way. Any gospel that is not founded on Christ and the cross, any ritual that is not ordained by God, anything that we do claiming that we are worshiping him and we are honoring him. If those things were not built on the cross, if they were not built on he who represents all the sacrifices in one or five in one God, all five sacrifices in one, he represents if we don't go through him and what he requires and he says I am the way so if you want to get it right follow my words you just follow me anything outside of what I require shall be deemed as strange and any flesh that's strange before the living God shall be cast into outer darkness 
where there shall be weeping and wailing. Who said that if you get up every morning and you ensure that you do your daily prayers and then in the evening you do another set of prayers that you'll make it in? How? Where does Jesus and the cross come in in your life? Where? If we continue to rub shoulders with people who continue to blaspheme the Holy Ghost and they continue to deny God and they continue to mock us, where is the cross? How do we expect to be received when we indulge in certain things? habitually, continually. Who told you that you can still do everything that you used to do and still make it through the narrow gate? Who told you that? And still make it on the narrow path? Who told you that? Let them continue to feed you with the sermons that are intended to boost your confidence about getting abundance. Continue to eat from those tables. Continue to feel like we shall all make it in forgetting that he made it clear. It's very narrow. And few, he says, he didn't say many, you know, he didn't say millions, he didn't say thousands, he didn't say hundreds, he says few, just few will find it. So let us continue to feel good and not ask ourselves, where is the Holy Spirit to convict us? Let's continue to not search the scripture for ourselves and seek after sound doctrine for ourselves. Let's continue to put our monies on altars. You know what? Let me say this quickly. Let me see. I've been on here one hour, 27 minutes now. I need to wrap up. I was speaking with someone recently and I've oftentimes spoken with individuals who would say things like, I'm, I, I have been throwing my tithes or throwing my offering with this ministry or at this pastor. Who uses familiar spirit? How? Do you not realize that you have actually been sponsoring witchcraft? Sponsoring through tithing and through giving our offering, sponsoring transactions with the devil, sponsoring demonic ministries and satanic assemblies. We sponsor with our monies. Then we don't expect that we're going to have or see implications on our finances. How come? How can you expect to, to be blessed financially when you continue to pour out? on altars that were not that are strange thank you holy spirit and where we are fed for instance we would never put anything there so let's continue to be backward in every way or in some ways and of course i'm being sarcastic at this point I'm saying to you, in other words, let's get it right before God. Because if it is strange, he will not accept it. And if it is strange, it's going to cause us to burn. If it's strange, it's going to backfire. If it is strange, it's not going to be a blessing. Instead, it's going to be a curse. If you have ears before God today, 
hear the spirit of God as he speaks. It's either you are hot or you are cold. And it's about time we get to that place where our discernment is so sharp that we can tell when something is just not of God. And when an atmosphere is not a holy atmosphere, it's either it's holy or it's not. If strange things are happening in that atmosphere, then therefore, whatever you are feeling, and if there's a so-called fire in there, it's not from heaven. It has to be from the author of confusion and from the prince of the air. Raise your hands, those of you who want to make things right with the Lord. I have to preach the word of God. And I have to tell you what he says in his word. I cannot give you false hope because those who teach the word are going to be judged with a stricter judgment. So I have to tell it to you, the whole thing I have to tell you. I can't just tell you the, the part that is sweet. I can't. I'm going to be held accountable. I was listening to a testimony or an interview the other day with this guy. I, I mentioned it earlier. He was sharing his experience when he died for a few minutes and he went to hell. The guy said he found himself at one point in what looked like a valley. And he said he saw before him pits. There were huge pits. But when he looked, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of pits. And he could hear people screaming and crying. He said when he looked, he also saw some mountains, okay? And he said, in the spirit, I've said this before through my experiences with the Lord Jesus. I would tell you that in the spirit, like you just know. So he said he knew that the people who were in the mountains, okay, and some were in cages, he said there was just this knowledge that would make you know that they were people who died many years ago, hundreds of years ago. So they had been in there for years. And here's something profound that he says. He said, while, you know, as he had come out, you know, and he's reflecting and so on, he says, in the natural, when someone goes to prison or jail, at least the person has been given a time so they know to expect their release after a certain number of years. And that's what gives someone who has been sentenced some hope. But in that place, there is no hope. He says, in that place, you will never ever be released. It's forever, it's eternity. The time will not be up after two years or after 10 years. They had been there for years and are still there. Do you hear me, family? Do you think it's a joke when the Lord Jesus says that there was a man who said this was the, the man who the rich man who paid no attention to the poor man whose name was Lazarus. He wished if he could just tip his finger on his saliva and give it to him. This young man who was giving his testimony, he said, and this is not the first time I've heard it. He said, there is no oxygen in hell. And he emphasized that we need to realize that when scripture says in him, we live, we move and have our being, it's true on all levels. All 
all good things, including the air we breathe, come from the living God. There is no oxygen in hell because oxygen comes from God. The man said, who, the Christians who are there, what did they do? How did they get there? He said, and I want to cut it out, but I want to make sure I put the right credentials. I want to put it on my page. He said they, they were there because they gossiped. They were there for gossiping, which was at the top, and backbiting. He said the pastors who were there, they were being tortured in a different way. They had done all manner of things. They promoted false doctrines, all manner of things they did. And he said already in hell, there is no oxygen. Yet Satan and his, de well, the demons, because they were the ones who were overseeing the different activities there. He said the demons would continue to put them in what looked like coffins and would shut them in. And he said, it's like they kept on repeating processes over and over again. So if a demon was stabbing you, you would you'll feel the stab, even the stab unto death, but because you can't die again, it's like you're always feeling the stab, feeling like dying, and then the process just keeps going on and on. The Lord Jesus has warned you, you know. There's a scripture that says you have started a good race. Who? Who hindered you? I don't know who is preaching another gospel to you. I don't know who is giving you false hope and who is telling you that there is another way. I'm here to tell you there's only one way. It goes for me and it goes for you. It goes for all of us. So let them do what they're doing. Many individuals who you see doing things. There's a time for everything. There's a time for people to do their folly and to feel like they're getting away with their folly. And there's a time for them to be judged and eternally punished for their folly. Do not be fooled. Run away, run for your life. Run, flee. Okay? And try to go the right way. What did we say the sin offerings were again in the correct order? Quickly type it in the comments. In the meantime, those of you who want to say yes to Christ Jesus, you want to give him your heart. Please say after me, Father, I repent of my sins. You know all the things I've said and done in my life that I should never have done or said. You know all the activities in which I've been involved that I had no business participating in. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I don't want this life that leads to destruction anymore. I've heard you and I'm hearing you now. Change me. Break me, melt me, and mend me again. And be very careful how you ask him to break you. If you're not prepared for it, don't ask for it. You want the easy way out. You're not ready for it. This narrow road is rough. Very rough. Do you hear me? Let me stop shooting. Please write down the following things quickly. So we have the sin offering, followed by the burnt offering, followed by the peace offering, followed by the meat offering. In fact, the meat, I think, came before the peace. Someone please review what sister Oh God, the thing has gone. There's a sister who put it there. Good. Sin, burnt, meat, peace, wave. Those 
are the five offerings in the respective order, okay? Now, if you missed the beginning of the sermon, it's very important that immediately after this live stream, you go back to the beginning. Tell them you need to listen from the start. Please make a note of the following announcement. You know that the encounter is going to be held in Florida on the 27th of April. I did mention we're going to be at the Hilton Hotel in West Palm Beach. No, we're not going to be having a second encounter in Florida. We're not going to be going to multiple locations like we did the last time we visited. This time we're only coming to West Palm uh, Beach by the grace of God. And once we are through with our assignment, we're going to be leaving. So the date for Florida is Saturday, April 27, address 125 Australian Avenue, West Palm Beach. Now, there are some excited people who I know who have already booked their flights of course, you know, people are going to be traveling from New York to the service. Thanks be to God. My team is going to be going. Thanks be to God. And some of the people who are going to be going to Florida have already booked their hotels. So speaking of hotels, guess what? So we're trying to reserve at a hotel, not at the, the said hotel, which is the Hilton, but at another hotel that's offering a really great rate, which is close to where we're going to be. We're trying to reserve a block of 10 rooms, okay? So five of those rooms are already taken. Therefore, five rooms in that deal that is being given are available. Please take down this WhatsApp number if you would like to reserve your room, okay? And I hear that when people are researching, the prices are way up. However, this one is good when compared to the others. It's really good. The number to which you ought to send your interest or tell me that you're interested. You know what? Just type interested in uppercase if you're interested in getting one of those rooms that are left, send the WhatsApp message to plus one eight seven six three one nine five one six three. Plus one eight seven six three one nine five one six three. Okay. Now the other thing I did mention to individuals, those who want to help to cover some of our expenses for traveling, that's for the team now. You're welcome to do so. You may send or text us at the same WhatsApp number I gave you. We'll give you the information. You just have to type sponsor, okay? Otherwise, you may go directly to the website, shadeenanglin.org forward slash donate. Now, here's something that the Lord has reminded me to say to you because many of you do not know this, okay? So those of you who've been asking, can I tithe in the ministry? Just because the ministry does not have a base does not mean it's not a ministry. Also, this ministry is a registered ministry, okay? That means those individuals who tithe with the ministry, there are persons who do, they get a tax break at the end of the year. So I thought I would make mention of that. So when you go to the website and you make any donation, they're tracked, okay? This ministry is legitimate in every way. It's registered with the government in the US. And so please make a note of that. If you have been inspired by the living God to tithe with the ministry, please send a WhatsApp message to me through the number that I gave you, plus one eight seven six three one nine five one six three, And you'll get the various means, the Zelle information if you want, however you want, which I, I do prefer that people go through the website, but whatever information you need, I'll give it to you. 
okay? We will give it to you, depending on who you talk to, right? God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Make sure before you leave, you give the video a like. Ensure that you share. Ensure that you subscribe. And we're not ashamed to talk about the Lord's business. Because truth be told, the people who are doing all manner of things and carrying out all manner of transactions with evil spirits, they're very proud and very open in their presumptuousness. And so when it comes on to the Lord's business, I will speak to you and I will look at you in your eyes. And I will say also to some of you that some of you, you know that the Lord has been speaking to you about being a blessing to the ministry that has blessed you. You know that, but we're not going there. God bless you. Have a great day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, family. Bye, everyone on TikTok. Make sure before you go, you give the video a like. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. I love you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, family. <laughs>